Okay, Salaamu Alaikum and good evening and uh, peace and blessings to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for a very, very pertinent topic, and that is uh, Muslims in prison. Uh, some of you will remember two years ago at City Circle, we did a talk on Muslim women in prison, and uh, there's a new report out on that. And many of you will have been aware of the Lamy Review, uh, which was uh, one of the most exhaustive uh, reviews into the criminal justice system and uh, racial bias within the criminal justice system. So tonight we have a distinguished panel. Uh, we have a third member who will be joining us. Um, he's coming all the way from Wales. So um, I've, it's taken me two hours across London, so hopefully he won't be too much longer. Uh, I will introduce our uh, distinguished speakers as they um, are about to speak. So if I just um, give perhaps some, some, an outline before we begin, the reason why there is such a concern about this is because of the rising number of Muslims in prison. Even prior to the Lamy review, between 2000 and 2005, there was a 122% increase. So in 2002, there were 5,502 prisoners identified as Muslim. By 2005, it was 7,246. And by December 2014, 12,225. The um, prison population over that time increased by 20% from an average of 70,000 to 778 to 84,691. So on the one hand, you had a 20% increase in the prison population, and then on the other hand, a 122% increase in the Muslim prison population. The Lambie Review found that in the last 10 years, so 2007 to 2017, there's been, um, again, a doubling of the uh, number of Muslims in prison. Muslims now account for 15% of all the prison uh, population. And if you consider that the last census in 2011 found that uh, the British population comprised of 4.4% Muslims, they're clearly grossly disproportionately represented almost three times uh, as many in prison as they are in the general population. And some people automatically think, well, there's a lot of, we hear about a lot of terrorism arrests, uh, particularly over the last 10, 12, 15 years. Uh, in relation to terrorism offences, between 2001 and 2012, there was a grand total of 175 terrorism convictions. So clearly the answer doesn't lie there. But what we're going to be doing this evening is we're going to be uh, discussing why uh, we've reached this situation, which, which is pretty catastrophic. What are the causes of this increased rise in the uh, prison population of Muslims? And what are the causes, what are the effects, and perhaps even try and identify a way forward. And what we like to do in our talks is not just preach to the converted, which is why we always videotape these things, uh, but also to try and um, t take things forward. So if anybody does wish to take forward a, a project group or join somebody, uh, for example, Ismail um, is doing a lot of work in this area, please do come and speak to us afterwards because more hands make light work and um, this is about our future. Uh, I came into the criminal justice system over 30 years ago and I've seen firsthand the increasing number of Muslims in prison. Uh, I remember being very green around the ears and always being like that, that sort of part of you that's like, oh my gosh, it's a Muslim. Um, and then just gradually, oh my God, half the list appears to be Muslim names um, and magistrates court, crown court, court of appeal, everywhere. Uh, but, as I say, we'll, we'll um, move ahead now with the, with the first speaker. And the first speaker, many of you will know him, Ismail uh, Lee South. Ismail is the co-director of the Salam Project, uh, which I think most of us are familiar with. The Salam Project is a social enterprise that currently coordinates ex-offenders, drop-ins, mental recruitment and prison outreach services. It assists offenders and ex-offenders. It helps them to apply for business startup, interest-free loans, hardship grants, signposting, free accredited training, job coaching, and job opportunities through 
various partners. And of course, in terms of rehabilitation, these things are very important and uh, to reduce reoffending, or as we call it technically, recidivism. <laughs> Uh, the project is sponsored by Unlimited and Faiths Forum for London. Through the Islam project, Ismail is also working in partnership with the Feltham Community Chaplaincy Trust and the Zahid Mubarak Trust on mentor recruitment plus other outreach projects. And he became involved in this work through family uh, issues uh, and some childhood friends as well who unfortunately became caught up in the criminal justice system. So very often these are the, the paths that lead us to take part in, in, in a lot of this um, very good work. Mm. So Ismail, if we can start with you, perhaps trying to unravel uh, why there's been this surge. Okay, um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, just to let you know, our dear sister here is hosting um, um, many ex-offenders that who come to me, they want legal advice. I have been sending to them our dear sister over the years. So sometimes she might get an odd call at 2 o'clock in the morning. So um, I'm due a, a little beatings later on. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, but she's helped. Um, she does also work with ex offenders as well, um, whereby she's helped many people who have referred to her with legal advice. So um, maximum credit is due to the Association of Muslim Lawyers and Sister Isma. Um, now, according to the House of Commons briefing paper written by Graham Allen and Chris Watson. Um, there's an overrepresentation of Muslims in British prisons. Now, in my experience, um, it's due to many different factors. I've narrowed them down to seven factors, um, seven, eight factors. And just to reiterate, how I got into this work um, was originally I used to work in banking, as well as I was also a poet as well. And then what happened was my nephew um, got involved in a gang and he was saying one day my sister had a spare key to my home. So all I know is I came home one day and I saw my sister there with my nephew and three suitcases. And my sister said, I've had enough of him, he's living with you now. And she walked out. Now anyone who has an older sister would understand where I'm coming from. I couldn't say anything. My parents were back home, were retired back in Jamaica, so I couldn't even complain to my parents. So, um, yeah, so basically I was, not, I don't want to say lumbered, but I was stuck with my nephew. And um, basically, my nephew, um, I could openly say, and I could say that it was, I believe that it was due to um, the, his family breakdown, whereby his mother and father separated, and he was trying to find himself and he was dealing with it and it opened my mind up to this world because this world I never really know about um, so eventually so I, so I used to bring him around with me um, when I finished work and of course some days he would just run off and do what he had to do and when he got um, him and his friends went out to a party and they thought it might be great for them to go to Marks and Spencer's and take some um, alcoholic drinks and in Mark Spencer's where the um, 10 security guards jumped them and they were sent to um, Felton, Felton Youth Offending Institution. Now when he was in there I had to go and I had to make effort to go and see him once a month and because by then I converted to Islam so I was new and my nephew used to come with me. I always said to my nephew listen even though I converted to Islam I'm not here to force it on you, it's up to you what you want to do. And even though sometimes he wanted to convert to Islam, I said to him, listen, I don't want you to convert to Islam for the sake of it, it's because I have. I want you to do things because you want to do it and when you're ready. So I've always said that to him, I've always emphasised that to him. So what happened was, later on when he got caught with the drinks and he got sent down, I used to go and visit him at Felton Prison and that's when I started to see a big population of Muslims. So because when, when my friends used to come to my house, they used to say things like inshallah and um, um, salam alaikum and because he knew all the rhetoric, he knew what everything meant. So when I came to see him, I'll never forget the first time I went to see him, he said, yeah, um, salam alaikum, aki, all of your akis are in here. 
because he's got a bit of a sense of humour. So I said, yeah, yeah. So I looked around and he said, yeah. So he's like, and then he started to speak to me in Arabic and I thought, what's going on here? So he said, yeah, it's just, it's, there's Somalis in here, there's Bengalis in here, Pakistanis, Moroccans. And he started to talk like the different little twangs of the different languages. I thought, my God. Um, so that's what opened my, my eyes to Muslims in prisons. And um, then while I was doing some youth engagement work in the community, and then we would see young people, um, including Muslims, who would get caught up in different things, and then they'll be in prison. And then I used to be, I used to get invited by some chaplains to go into prisons to give talks and so forth. So that's how I got into the work. And then there's some school friends that I, one time I went to a prison, to do a talk and I saw one of my friends from school and I was like, oh my gosh. So um, that kind of brought the message home again, even though I had my nephew <coughs> inside. But when I saw someone from school, someone who I used to play football with at 11 years old, it kind of brought the message home that this is a serious thing. And um, so it's been a journey. So that's how I got into this work, so it wasn't planned. And then, um, like I said, I was working in banking and then after a while I just, I just got sick and tired of banking and I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I was able to set up my own social enterprise. So, what I've noticed is, it's in every community. So, I'm from the Afro-Caribbean community, my parents are Jamaican, and it's a big problem. And it's also, and many people within the Afro-Caribbean community, especially within the, the church, many of them are oblivious, they don't, a lot of them don't want to address it. A lot of them don't, um, they ignore it. And only when it's someone like the pastor of the church or a senior person in the church, when it's one of their sons or daughters, that's when I've seen them to make it an issue. And um, what I'm beginning to see is that same mentality is very similar in the Muslim community. So when you're going into like Brent, where I'm originally from, Northwest London, it's one of the highest rates of ex-offenders. And um, I was doing some work with the interfaith organisation, Faith Swamp for London, and we were trying to get some mosques in the community to do some engagement with ex-offenders because they had a large population of Muslim ex-offenders. Many of the mosques tried to make out this, there's not a problem, there's not an issue, no, it's okay, we're fine. And then sadly, until one of them, one of the trustees or the imam or someone high up within the ranks, something happened with their young ones, then they would call back and say, yes, can we do something? Um, but anyway, like I said, so my opinion is the rise of Muslim prisoners are these eight reasons. And some of you might agree with some of them, some of you might disagree with some of them, some of you might agree with all of them or disagree with all of them. I would say these are the eight. The first thing I would say is there's a bigger need for Muslim youth engagement and empowerment, especially spaces without judgment for youth and community engagement. Because many um, young people that we meet, they feel that, um, with all due respect, mosques <coughs> are like old men clubs, how the way um, English people see the old legion clubs, with all due respect. So they feel that's not a place where they can hang out. And because we know due to cuts, many youth clubs have been closed down and so forth. Many young people are just hanging out in the street, um, recreationally. And sometimes it just takes one little thing and bore them to get caught up in something. And the second reason I would say is that um, we need, there's a, big, there's a big need for Muslim sensitive, Islamic aware, family support services, i.e. like counselling, therapeutic trauma initiatives being made easily available. Because um, as we know, divorce is a very big issue within all communities, and especially within the Muslim communities. And likewise with my nephew, and I'm seeing it happen in, within the Muslim communities, when there's a lot of divorces, it's causing a lot of trauma, and causing a lot of issues within the home, and whereby you know, the family members go somewhere else for comfort. Because, as we know, divorces and causes, it disables families. And we have to remember, um, and I believe the third reason is, 
we need to promote and celebrate more positive British Muslims and heroes and sheroes within our community um, who stay true to their culture. I personally believe, because when people say, oh, there's not enough Muslim role models, I think that's a lot of rubbish because we've got many good role models sitting right here on this panel here and I don't believe they're celebrated enough by the British Muslim community internally and externally by British society. And I believe if we celebrate more of our heroes and sheroes within the community, they will be seen role models within the community that will show the younger generation that yes, I can achieve in the society. Because there's some people within the Muslim community, like I said, this is my opinion again, who are promoting, yes, yes, we do know that Islamophobia does exist. Yes, I'm not denying that. Yes, racism does exist. Yes, I can't deny that. But we have to always show there's positives as well. There's, there's a positive side as well. There are many people who overcome adversity. They overcome being uh, racism, Islamophobia, sexism, and they still achieve. And I believe we need to promote these stories as well. Because one time um, I was given a workshop somewhere and some guy said, oh, we're Muslims, we ain't going to get no jobs. The system's against us. What's the point? That and I said, no. And, and I've realised that this negative narrative that certain people and organisations are pushing is having an adverse effect on our young people. Yes, there are discrepancies within the system. Yes, racism does exist. Yes, Islamophobia does exist. But there are many achievers within the system, like these two wonderful people in the panel, like my sister Ismet from the Association of Muslim Boys and my brother Hashi QC. Oh, no, not yet. <laughs> QC High Commissioner, inshallah. <laughs> okay. And um, yes, number five is what we all know. And I know um, Hashi and his sister Ismet will be going more into this is discrimination within the criminal justice system. That goes without doubt. It is there, I'm not denying it, and I'm not defending the criminal justice system. The Lamy's report is self-evident and it's thoroughly researched and it proves that there is racism, discrimination within the criminal justice system. But, and also, number six, we have to recognize, and I believe it's also due to a rising population of Muslims in the UK, i.e. immigration, we have to remember also, Muslims love to have babies. So there's a high birth rate, with all due respect, among Muslim families. So are we giving birth to criminals? No, I'm saying, no, 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 I'm not saying that. No, I'm saying that when the first statistic was stated by Sister Isma in 2002, the population of British, of Muslims in the UK then, compared to Muslims in 2015 and 16, has considerably changed. And I, without even seeing the statistics, I'm going, if I go to the area that I'm originally from, um, Wilsdon and Kilburn, there weren't much Muslims there. But when I go to the area where I'm originally from, now there's big Muslim communities there. I, when I go to Shepherd's Bush, and the place where I used to hang out in my younger years, oh, okay, it's like, it's, like, it's like I'm in a, a Muslim country. So, so it's self-evident that there's more Muslims in the UK. Um, I think it's because, sorry. Yeah, no, no, please, please. <laughs> um, I think it's because living in uh, metropolitan areas, that's where BME communities are concentrated. So in London, there's a high density of Muslims. Yeah. And yes, um, I'm probably the eldest on this panel, um, from when I was a kid, um, late 70s, early 80s, there has been an increase, but the figures don't stack up. So mm -hmm. the increase, there has of course been an increase in Muslim population, especially second, third generation. Uh, we do tend to have more children than our non-Muslim counterparts, uh, but that's something that on the face of it may seem like a, a reasonable assumption, mm -hmm. but if then one drills down into the figures, it doesn't quite explain yeah. the, the increase. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's certainly a factor one needs to consider. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And also number seven, I put um, that there are many Muslim families in the UK. I'm not trying to, I was trying to find some statistics, uh, statistics to, to find evidence, but it's been proven that there's a lot, I was trying to find the exact amount that many Muslim families in the UK belong to lower social economic groups and former chief inspector of prisons 
Dame and Owers published a report on Muslims in jail in which she linked the growth in numbers to the age of social economic profiles of Muslim populations in general. Both are powerful predictors of involvement in criminal justice. In the criminal justice system, she wrote, and Muslims in Britain have a notably younger age profile than non-Muslims and are more likely to come from lower socio-economic groups. And number eight, I put as one of the other reasons, is, um, is linked to what I said in number six, is like the growth of refugees, immigration, engagement. And because as we know, there have been refugees coming from Syria and other war-torn countries, um, and also immigration engagement. And I believe there's, it's easy to say there's not enough refugee and immigration engagement um, but what I believe is that, they, like everyone, we all need to improve. I think there needs to be more work done in engaging with refugee and immigration organisations to provide a more holistic service because there's a high rate of refugee immigra and immigrants within the prison systems who are Muslim. Now, I'm slightly going to go off a bit now. I said, as we know, I believe there's also bigger issues with regarding to reoffending, and a few would disagree that in fact the reoffending rates of Muslim prisoners are a bit lower, or nearly 40%, whereby the national average is 45%. And those, those are the statistics by the Ministry of Justice. And we believe that the way of challenging reoffending within among the Muslim prisoners um, is that we need, hopefully, we could spark a campaign in the future where we could get Muslim charities sponsoring mentors to engage with Muslim prisoners, because as you know, within some families, especially among some Muslim families, when they go in prison, many, many are shunned by their family. So when they come out, some, in some cases, the family have disowned them. And I believe we could build a task force in the future, and being very optimistic, where we could engage Muslim businesses to have a policy of giving employment opportunities, work experience opportunities um, for Muslim prisoners so, so they can work as they learn or earn while, you, earn while you learn, as they say. And because many people we offend because they just want to earn some money. Um, and also I'd like to thank the National Zakat Foundation um, because they've helped many ex-offenders who have sent to them with grants, hardship grants to pay off certain bills and get rehoused. And also the Zahid Mubarak Trust who do campaigns and who look into issues around discriminations within the criminal justice system. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening to me. And if there's any, I'm always looking to learn, looking to work in partnership with any organisation and any person who's looking to do positive work in working for the betterment of helping prisoners and ex-offenders. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is uh, Hashi Mohammed, not quite QC, but not far off, inshallah. Uh, so, um, Hashi is a very experienced barrister, experienced in the areas of public law, human rights, planning, and environmental law. And he's a barrister at number five chambers. He uh, also does a lot of media work. He presents documentaries on BBC Radio 4, uh, areas such as terrorism and how nations react, and on social mobility in Britain. In 2016, Hashi was appointed as Special Advisor to David Anderson QC, the Independent Reviewer of Terrorism and Legislation. Um, Hashi um, was asked to stay on in this role to the new Reviewer of Terror Legislation, Max Hill QC. And uh, I, I know Hashi has um, a lot to say on this topic also, so I know some of it will have been covered by Ismail, so I'm sure you'll endorse some of that. But uh, what do you think are the main pressure points? Thank you very much um, for the invitation and sorry for uh, coming a bit late and starting late. I don't know if, uh, if it's on or not. Oh, there we go, it's on now. Uh, thank you very much, Dania, as well, for organising this, Ismail. Um, I mean, I won't take much time because I usually find that these discussions are better once we're able to talk to each other and, and discuss things in a, in a, in a bigger context. But, from my own experience, I grew up in Brent, uh, in a place called Stonebridge, 
and if you know what Stonebridge is about, then you'll know where I've come from. It wasn't the most uh, well looked after area, it's probably one of the most deprived areas in London, went to famous schools and I've seen firsthand uh, what real criminality looks like on the streets of London. I've had many relatives of mine who've crossed paths uh, with police as have I when I was younger, never convicted of anything I should add. Uh, but I've got brothers who've been in prison and I've got many friends who I went to school with who are serving sentences. And so I know this area quite intimately for a variety of reasons. But I will just touch upon a number of factors that I think are quite relevant to this and hopefully we can engage in a conversation a bit more later. The other thing I should add is just precisely because I have come from that background and precisely because I've had an encounter with that issue in that raw way growing up that I chose specifically not to do criminal law and because also it doesn't pay, literally. Um, and so that, in that respect, it's, it's a different kind of context. So I boil down to my mind what the issues are in, a, in very specific terms to sort of three or four areas really. The first is the question that was asked in, of me by uh, Dania in, in the email that she sent was, was about whether there was a link to the social background and it's a very specific statistic that she quoted here which I think is quite important where she said is there a link to social background with 50% of Muslims living in the 10% most deprived local authority areas in the UK. So more than half, almost half of the British Muslim population are growing up in the 10 most deprived wards. It's not just deprived constituencies or cities, it's even more specific than that. It's the 10 most deprived wards. And that tells you a great deal because what it tells you is, it tells you that they're growing up in a community that is low on a poverty of, uh, 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 in terms of ambition. There's a great deal of poverty going on uh, and there's a great deal of criminality in some respects, whether that be low level or high level. And there's a great deal of despair. Now, does that mean because you're growing up in a deprived ward that you are naturally then going to become a criminal? Of course it doesn't. Does it mean that if you are born into a community that is low on ambition that all you will amount to is a drug dealer? Of course it doesn't. But it certainly does increase the statistics and the likelihood and the probability that that is what you're going to be exposed to. It's a no-brainer. So I think that is one of the issues, and I know that from first hand, and I think that's one of the factors that we, I would love to hear from uh, you all later. The, other, the next point is I've, I've marked down is the crisis of masculinity. It's no, it's no um, secret to say that the vast majority of these people who are Muslims, or even black for that matter, in prison are male. And let's not beat around the bush about that. That's the reality. They're not the, the, the women. Of course, there are women in prison, but it's, it pales in comparison. So there is that element of that crisis of masculinity of a lot of men growing up without role models, often without fathers, and often without any real guidance, and which the streets every year uh, manages to take away and that leads to a great deal of despair. The third, as I have identified, is the issue of identity. This man might talk about refugees coming and all the, um, and those kind of elements, but I, I don't recognize that because I was a refugee and I didn't amount to just being a criminal, for example, nor did most of my family. So for me, the other bigger factor is this question of identity. So many British Muslims and uh, young black males often struggle with this idea of identity. Who are you? Why are you here? What is it that you are aspiring to do? What is your purpose? And if you're struggling with that question, again, I'm not suggesting that just because you're struggling with that question, you will go straight into criminality, but that is a factor. Because if you don't have that role model to talk to you, if you don't have that person to explain to you what it means to be a man, 
If you don't have that person explaining to you what your purpose, your role, your core being in this society is about, you will struggle. And again, you might find a home in that gang that's at the cross road from your house, you, because they, find, they give you that sense of belonging, they give you that sense of uh, having a purpose, and before you know it, you're down a path that leads to further uh, away from any constructive purpose in society. The next is, absolutely, the criminal justice system is skewed against you because when the judges and the juries and all these people come forward, yes, you're much more likely to be convicted. Don't take it from me. Look at the Lamy Review. Clear as day that there is a problem of discrimination within the criminal justice system. You can't get away from that. You can't get away from that and you are more likely to be convicted and you are more likely to be convicted of longer sentences if you're a black man or a black person than you are if you're white. So once you get in the system, it's clear that you're more likely to be thrown down the deep end. Then further, once you're in the system, the likelihood of you reoffending again, is quite high. So there's no way of breaking that chain once you're in the system. So again, it's that self-fulfilling prophecy and that self-fulfilling constant circular that leads to a great deal of issues which then never allows you to break away. And then the final thing is, is quite simply, yes, uh, there has been a huge rise of Muslims who are overly represented in the criminal justice system. And I don't think that's necessarily because of the fact that you know, so many of them, when they get into the, 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 the prison, you know, it doesn't necessarily follow that they convert and therefore the statistics are accounted for by the virtue of they've gone in as a non-Muslim, but they've come out as a Muslim and therefore the statistics just sort of that, because I don't think that that is the reality. I think it's much, much deeper. And that, again, comes back to that question of identity, masculinity, discrimination within the system, socio-economic background, and the kind of climate of war on terror, of uh, all these issues that we face that mean that at this specific moment in time, at this defining kind of period, it, 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 it makes perfect sense, quite frankly, that the statistics show what they show, for the reasons that I've mentioned. I could keep going and explaining a number of other things, but I thought I'd just touch on the key points that I thought were, uh, from where I'm, I'm sitting, are the main issues, and I'd be happy to uh, open up and discuss some more, uh, disagree with you even, on, on what, that, what that all means. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Ashley. Thank you. <coughs> So, uh, last but not least, and not from Brent, no. but a lot further, <laughs> a lot further field, like these two delightful gentlemen on either side of me, mm. Maria bin uh, Sufyan is our um, final speaker. Uh, Maria is involved with uh, Through the Gate mentoring for all prisons across South Wales, and also the female prison, HMP Eastwood Park in England. He monitors HMP Park through the IMB Independent Monitoring Board, and monitors the movement of detained people from police stations and prisons to courts and checks on their detentions, detention whilst they are in magistrates court and crown courts from west to south Wales uh, for the prison escort custody services. Moye monitors Cardiff and Vale Health Board through the Community Health Council and sits on Social Care Wales as a panel member. He's also involved with another nine different public bodies and charities. He has uh, considerable experience in the criminal justice system through his time with the South Wales Police Authority and the National Policing Improvement Agency, and he still manages to look very young for all that. Um, so firstly, thank you so much for coming so far and um, having quite a traumatic journey. Uh, if you'd like to perhaps share with us your thoughts as to why there is such a disproportionate presence of Muslims within the prison estate. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Apologies for being late. A uh, two and a half hour journey came into a four and a half hour one. I should, have, I should have known London traffic, but it seems everyone was out today. It's Friday and schools break up in Wales next week, so the, the traffic was a lot more. But again, thank you uh, for having me this, uh, this evening. I, 
apologies because a lot of the things have already been dis uh, mentioned but uh, someone who works within the criminal justice system I've got a lot of figures, facts and figures so I won't bore you with them but what I will do is just gloss over them because a lot of them have already been mentioned um, but if I go back, in terms of my background, I've, you know, I've been within the criminal justice uh, for many, many years. Um, I went into business after leaving university, but I felt that I felt bored of just doing one thing. So I felt I wanted to do more and give back to the community. So from a relatively young age, I was active in voluntary, the charity sector and public appointments. So hence why I sit on a few different bodies. Um, my experience, uh, I've worked I cover England and Wales with all the different hats that I wear. But in terms of just the criminal justice system, I, you know, I, I was digging out some figures, um, the latest figures that when we look at a Muslim in terms of the topic that we have today. So if we go back, in terms of 2002, the, the prison population of the Muslim prison population in England and Wales was approximately 5,500. Uh, that was back in 2002. And now, three years later, that went up to 7,200. Um, by the end of 2014, that was 12,225. At the moment, it's around 13, just over 13,000. We make up approximately 5% of the prison, uh, sorry, of the pub, public. Um, but yet, in the prison system, we make up nearly 15 to 16% of the prison population. Now, we could look at, say, well, okay, the Muslim population has grown, uh, the prison population has grown, but in fact, the prison population uh, has grown from 70,000, just, just under 80,000, sorry, 70,700 in 2002 to nearly 86,000 this week, uh, 86,300 uh, to be precise. So it's gone up by 15,000. So the prison population has increased by 20%, but the Muslim population of the prison population has grown by nearly 120%. Now that's dis disproportionate figure to, to the figures. Now, if we look back, I, the argument I always have, people have with me is that, you know, a rise of uh, prevent counterterrorism, the wars, a seen a surge of people being arrested. Well, that doesn't bow down in terms of the figures. The actual people that have been arrested and convicted that within the prison population that are Muslim, that are under terrorism offences, are around about 1 or 2%. So that's a small percentage of, so that's around 100 to 200 Muslim prisoners within. The, the category of Muslim prisoners make up the, the, the terrorism offences, uh, and they can, they can vary in different uh, different ways. But the general prison uh, Muslim population range from uh, sexual offences, robbery, theft, criminal drug offences, just a general crime, what everyone else seems to be in prison for. Now, if we look back, if we go back to when my, fourth, when my grandfather came here in the 1960s, um, when we look at so social exclusion, racism, um, lack of role models, they had that in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, but yet we didn't see a surge in uh, crime and prison population and troubles that we have seen today with our youth, so my generation and the generation just before. I mean, I come from an area where, where in the 60s and the 50s you used to have signs outside hotels and, uh, and b and &Bs. it said no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. These are, the, these, these are the things that our forefathers had to come and deal with. Um, and I, I live just outside of Cardiff. Cardiff is a very multicultural city. It's one of the most diverse places in the UK. It's the oldest Yemeni and Somali community. It was, it was used to have the busiest dock in the world because the British Empire was run from coal. And Cardiff was the busiest port. The first mosque in the UK was built in Cardiff. I mean, the history is endless. So we have a lot more integration in South Wales and that I see in metropolitan areas with these bigger Muslim populations. The lack of, the lack of integration, lack of uh, community cohesion, uh, ghettos, as you want to call them, social exclusion, um, lack of education for our youngsters, and wanting to get rich quickly. That's what I see. My, my jobs, I'm in the prison system, so what I do is I, I, I see prisoners in prison, I see detained people because they're not convicted, in the courts and in the police station, I see him within the custody suites, I see him in the police stations, and then I see him in hospitals as well if they, if they go through that system, if they're drug addicts or, or other health conditions. Now, if, for example, if we say that it's discrimination 
In terms of the Lamy report, you know, it has proven there is discrimination, but that's just not with Muslims, that's just generally with BME population. So if we take that out, why has it been such a surge? Um, and there's a number of factors, and a lot of them have already been raised, so I, I won't go over them. But in terms of what I think that we can do, um, in terms of us here and people that are professional, so there's a, within the prison system, there's something called, it's just been around for the last few years, uh, something called through the gate mentoring. So what happens is a um, number of organisations uh, in different prisons in England and Wales do it different. But what basically happens is when, before someone is released, uh, a referral is made from the resettlement team within the prison to a through the gate mentoring provider, whoever that may be. Now, someone would come and visit that prisoner within the prison, doesn't matter whether he's Muslim, BMU, or just any prison, prisoner. So someone would visit them within the prison. Once they, they would do an action plan, they would see the, their needs, their housing needs, medical needs, family needs, whatever their needs are when they're released. So they would see him two weeks, three weeks before they're released. Once they're released, they would meet them on the prison gate and help them, A, first, first port of call is probation, they have to Go, and, uh, go to a promotion appointment, be that CRC or, or uh, NPS, uh, depending on which category the prisoner comes into. So once they're released, they have to do probation, then from there, they have to go to housing. If they're, if they're homeless, they have to, uh, to put attending drug and alcohol uh, appointments, or they have to try and be reintegrated back into society. So as there's a, there's a lack of Muslim uh, uh, organisations that cater for uh, prisoner, uh, ex-offenders, uh, service users, prisoners, whatever you want to call them, a uh, leaving prisoner. Uh, and that's just, uh, if not to take it out of London, in London, Wales, in London is not the only place in the UK, sometimes you forget about it because all the funding comes here. But if you take it, but if you take that out, there, there's, there's prisons all over England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So there's a lack of organisations, charities that cater for people, not just for Muslims, but generally the people that are leaving prison. I'll give you an example. So if a prisoner uh, leaves on a Friday afternoon, so a Friday morning he's released from prison, he goes and, he goes and sees a probation officer or an offender manager, they give him his license agreement, they sign the paperwork. Now, because he's been in prison for X amount of years or X amount of months, it really doesn't matter, he's released. Once he's in the community, after he's done probation, he has to go to a local authority because he's homeless, for example. He has no roof over his head, he has no accommodation. Now the legislation has changed where there's no duty of care on prisoners. So when someone is released, when they go to a local authority, there's no duty of care unless they have a medical or a, or a mental condition that they need to be housed. And only then if there's an accommodation available. So most prisoners that leave, most young people that, that, that are BME, that are Muslim, that are leaving, are relatively young. Uh, when they leave, they, they, they're not in that category somewhat. So what would happen is they won't get housed. So what, what would they do then? So on a Friday, uh, on a Friday evening, you've got the weekend coming up, it's bitterly cold. Uh, I, I speak to a number of the prisoners that keep uh, the revolving door where they're coming in and out, in and out of prison, and ask them why do they keep doing that. But the, the, they turn around and just say, "Well, look, I need a roof over my head. I can't be living on the street um, in the cold. So it's better for me to um, commit a crime, go back into the criminal justice system, and come back and." Um, uh, and back into somewhere into a warm environment. Okay, and if we look, that's just in terms of one of the organisations, but what could we do as the public is we can get more involved in public appointments. For example, there's things like the Independent Monitoring Board where each prison has an IMB. So any, anyone can apply. Uh, it's an application process through the MOJ, Ministry of Justice. You apply, you sit on those boards, and you monitor that prison. There's lay observers which monitor the courts and the custody. You could be that. You could be a custody visitor in police stations, you could monitor that. So when, when you have things like the Lamy report that says you institutionally racism within the criminal justice, well, we, we can make a difference if we get involved. If we're not involved, then we won't be able to make that difference. Um, and, um, I, I, a number of the issues have already been raised, and you know, we won't go over them, but I'll be happy to go through them in question and answer. Thank you thank so much, thank you. Yeah. So uh, we're going to open the floor to um, any issues, anything you think may not have been raised, or any concerns that you have. Uh, so, does anybody want to contribute to the discussion? 
thank you, young man there. So I haven't got my glasses on, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not so young. <laughs> um, I just want to say thanks very much. It's a very enlightening talk. And um, my father, bless his soul, used to have an old African saying which said it's not the hunger that kills the person, it's the full stomach that used to kill the person. And I just wonder if that explains some of the generational, generational issues in terms of our par parents' generation and the new generation. So it's not actually the external factors that have the majority of the impact, but it's the value system and the work ethic of those people that prevented them falling into crime. And we don't, we don't have that now. And some of the reasons were mentioned about role models, father figures, etc., etc. But I, I just wanted to find out from the panel and perhaps those people who have experience in the criminal justice system, how, how do the Muslim population see their value, the, their terms of reference in terms of values of, as Muslims and being criminals and being reoffenders? How, how do they see that in terms of their identity? So as a Muslim in jail, how does he see himself as a Muslim and a criminal? Because those things should be incompatible, as opposed to what the wider Muslim population might see themselves in terms of their value system. Thank you. I think, Ismail, you work directly with, ex, uh, with yeah. offenders yeah. and ex-offenders, yeah. and you discuss identity with them. Yeah. So it depends on the individual, because some of them feel shame and embarrassed, whereby some depending on their, their groupings, they don't feel no shame with it. They, because all of their friends, in some cases, sometimes are all Muslims and they're all criminals. Because um, not so much n um, now, and from my experience, it was more, I would say seven, eight years ago, there were more Muslim grouping gangs that used to, and they used to build networks and then they, like a Muslim gang, for example, in Harlesden or in Wembley, they would have a good link with um, Hackney and Whitechapel and in Birmingham, Leicester, and prison became a place where they built like a network. So, they, but then what happened is later on, those people started to infight themselves, so that, that, that's no longer a thing. So I would say it depends on the, the groupings of the person. So they, they, some people, they, they would say openly, yeah, I belong to a Muslim gang. But then you see some people, they'll feel ashamed to say, yeah, yes, I'm Muslim and I'm in prison, they'll feel ashamed. So it just depends on the individual. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yes, of course. I mean, it's fascinating because, I mean, I, I'm literally in prisons all day, you know, and I tell someone that I'm in and out of prisons, they find it funny when they tell their friends. But what I see the identity of Muslim prisoners grow uh, in terms of religious, they feel more passionate about their religion in prison than they do outside, which is fascinating. So if you see the makeup of the chaplaincy within the prison, so you, I mean, I read my Friday prayers in the different prison just so I can get a feel of what's going on. And they're more there's more passion for Islam within the prison, so they feel they have some sort of identity, some belonging. Uh, not more so in, as in a gang, but just generally they feel they, feel they want to be closer to something and, and that comes in, into a religion aspect of it. So there's a lot more um, religious aspect to the prison's life. So, you know, in terms of eating halal, for example, making sure that they have prayer times, Eid, Ramadan, all of those things which probably they don't do on the outside, they tend to do better in the inside. And the conversion to reverse... Why, why, why do you think that is? I, it's, it's just a mixture. I mean, it, it comes down to having an identity of belonging within the prison system. So sometimes gangs in certain prisons, uh, different d depending on which prison you go to, sometimes people cluster together. So it could be the BME. Uh, within the BME, you have the Somalians, the Pakistanis, and the Indians that cluster together. But as a general rule, the Muslims sort of cluster together. So be that the Friday prayers, the Ramadan, Eid, or any of the, the religious holidays that come under that. Um, but I. It is, it is fascinating because when they leave, then they revert back to what they did before they come in. But in terms of revert uh, prisoners, so Muslim converting, uh, so people converting to Islam, it's a huge, it's a, a huge trend, and a, a significant portion of the prison population is by reverts. So people converting to Islam within the prison system. Um, 
and that's quite a bit, and that's and that's growing steadily um, day by day, um, which obviously skewed the figures because they were born into a Muslim family, they went into the prison system and converted to Islam within the prison and come out, and they tend to be, when they come out, they, their reoffending tends to be lower than the general prison population, which is interesting. Oh, okay. And Go on. Sorry, um, we'll just get some more contributions from the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody. I just want to say comments and to ask questions because I, I come from countries where the percentage of Muslims in prison is 50 or 60 percent. Uh, I grew up in Switzerland and I lived in France and in both countries we reach like 60 percent of people in prison being Muslim. But for many people it's normal. So it's not debate and it's like something that most people have found uh, normal without asking questions because I think out there, and my question is here, I don't know if it's similar because many things you, you have said today is similar that points I have observed in these countries. And the point is out there there is a link between street culture and Islam. It's very uh, linked together for about 15 years or 20 years. So, in a way, for instance, the French rap is full of Islamic reference, and when we go out in the street, there is this confusion between Muslim, Islam, Islamic identity, and crime or street culture, which is more or less close to crimes, in which many Muslims refer without being involved in real crime. So this link makes people going from the streets to prison and identify themselves as Muslims as something natural, being part of a global culture which combines Islam references and street culture. So I was wondering in, if in the UK it was the same kind of um, link between both or not. So Hashi, do you want to address that? Because growing up where you were <coughs> in Stonebridge, and your personal experiences with people. Yeah, um, I, I lived in France too, so I, I, I know this question very well. Um, a couple of things on this, because I wanted to also go back to the, the question that was asked earlier, which was about values, which I think I want to address at some point. But on, it's a different, it's a different context with the United Kingdom as opposed to France, because France has a particular problem with a tiny group of people who are, who've come from North, North Africa, for example, and have a huge population from North Africa who have found themselves there and who are exclusively Muslim. Whereas in this country, you could meet a Somali Muslim, to a Nigerian Muslim, to a South Asian Muslim, to a recent convert from Jamaica. So the Muslim community in terms of the UK is so vast and diverse as compared to the French one, which is essentially drawn from, let's be frank, Algeria or Morocco and Tunisia a little bit. And so it's different, and you're quite right, the rap culture is completely uh, full of the Islamic references. I remember there's a rapper called Diams, mm. who was a great like rapper, and then all of a sudden she stopped rapping and was wearing a a full burqa and gave up rapping all of a sudden and I remember thinking you know what, what but somehow it was it was all very mixed and you're right there's a huge population of Muslims in prison in France for example nowhere near the figures that we're facing here Switzerland I know less about so I think that's true but I don't think that that is the reality here in terms of the way that rap culture street culture becomes and has become synonymous with with Islam in the way that it is in, the, in France. But going back to the question about values and also about conversion, I've got a theory on this. I'm very hesitant about these kind of questions that suggest that somehow the problem that you face with why you've got so many black men, for example, in prison, and therefore so many Muslims also from prison is somehow linked to the value system of those communities that means that somehow that it's the same kind of mentality and notion of the work, white working class communities who have problems therefore it must mean that their value system is corrupt or is lacking something that means that these people are 
I'm very hesitant about going down that route and I, I would reject that analysis because I'm somebody who grew up without a father. My father died when I was nine years old. But here's an interesting difference. The friends that I grew up with in Brent who were growing up without fathers, often their fathers were alive but not around. At least with me, I knew where my father was. He was gone. I could be at peace with that. But if you're a young boy growing up without a father and your father chose to be absent, you have no idea what that does to you as a human being. You have no idea the way it eats away at you, the way I saw it eat away at my friends, so many of them. Because from a very young age, you already believe that you've been rejected by the very man to whom you would have sought guidance. And that destabilizes you in ways that most of us will never fully appreciate unless you really fully understand that. And so when you go to prison and you convert and you're given a new name, a Muslim name, it's almost like a rebirth. You begin again. It's a new start. You have a new community, crucially, not judging you. Islam is your own interpretation told to you by those guys who you've been hanging around with and nobody can tell you any different. And that's why they become more, pope, more Catholic than the Pope. That's why they become so zealous in prison. That's why those guys who would have been eating their bacon sandwiches and drinking beers, like Anjum Chowdhury, will ask for halal when he's in prison. Because these people are just looking for something deeper much deeper in their minds and hearts that they seem to find in Islam and therefore seem to be more zealous than most Muslims who are going about their lives daily without having to go down that route. And so going back to your question about value systems, you have to just peel away the layers to fully understand the problem and why you've got a disproportionate number of people. And finally, you look at the profile of the guy who did the attack in um, Westminster. Do you remember the guy who drove? No, no, no. The, Westminster. The, Westminster the Westminster one Westminster. who drove, yeah. who was a, 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 a convert, a revert, whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. Read back at his story. This is a guy who was a complete misfit, having lots of issues, low-level criminality, criminal conviction, converts to Islam, new name, new beginning, you will never be judged. One more thing, paradise awaits you. This is how you finish. It's a very common story. It's a very common journey. So just think about that as well before you latch on to very simple ideas like it's Islam or it's the value system or it's because of this, that or the other. So I've got a little bit too. No, no, not at all. Um, I think your hand was up first and then you. Thanks. Um, Thanks for your uh, contributions um, and the questions that have been asked. I, I, I think I feel a little bit uncomfortable at the um, general sort of approach of this meeting that seems to be to accept the, in the first instance, the disproportionate imprisonment of the Muslim population is somehow justified and then to seek to explain it rather than to think why is there a disproportionate view and not to look within not to assume, well, there must be a problem within the community, which is why Muslims are disproportionately represented in the prison system, but, well, there's a problem with the criminal justice system, and there's a problem with the prison system, and that this is really connected to Britain and its history, and the way in which particular racialized populations, and it's not just the Muslim population, but it is um, disproportionately the Muslim population with the current political climate, but it has a very long history in Britain's colonial history, in the way in which um, Britain needed to construct Muslims as a particular threat in order to maintain its subjugation and power over particular societies across the world. And Muslims living in Britain today are experiencing that very same over-surveillance of them, this, in the same way that black communities experience it, you know, we all know that when, when you're in a, when you're brown, you're in a gang, when you're black, you're in a gang, but if you're white, well, you have friends. And there's a lot of research in this, looking at precisely how, um, for example, the um, legislation used on um, joint enterprise association, people are picked up 
and, and the language of gangs and the rhetoric of gangs is used in a way that particularly stigmatizes um, young people of color in this country. And I think that it would be good when communities get together, um, you know, and I came here today as part of the Muslim community, hoping that there would be some discussion that th thought, well, how can we resist and fight back against this disproportion, as opposed to thinking, well, what's, what's the problem in the way I'm raising my children? I mean, the, the issues that you raise about divorce, etc. the white community has exactly the same issues. But who gets picked up for smoking weed, for example? It's not the white middle class child. Um, it's, it's the black um, child that gets picked up. Um, and it's the black child that gets stopped and searched. You know, it's the black, um, it's the children, as you say, on the street without these sort of, um, um, any other way to relate. They get picked, I mean, who is it that gets picked up? It, it's people of color. So I think, yeah. no, we totally, you know, yeah, totally but, but I think that's the key. I mean, most of the conversation I feel yeah. has been spent looking at inward as if, well, there's a, cultural problem or there's a problem where we have or we have to try not to get divorced. It's not that the white community don't get divorced. I mean divorce rate is much higher in the white community. Yeah, no, so totally, totally, totally encourage kind of more you've, you've given your um, structural racism yeah, no, as opposed to You've demonstrated your concern very comprehensively, and I think each of the panellists has said that there is racism within the criminal justice system. No. And it's over 30 years, I've seen um, the uh, racism in the criminal justice perpetrated again and again and again. However, as we've um, all been at pains to emphasise, there's no simple cause and there's no simple factor that accounts for the disproportion, disproportionate numbers of Muslims in prison. So we can't just say, oh, it's racism within the criminal justice system. That's not the only factor. Uh, if you take a, a, a straight line through it, socio being born into a socioeconomic, socioeconomically deprived area will automatically put you at a disadvantage. Then, when you go to school and you don't, and the teachers Absolutely. are discriminating against you, then that adds another layer of disadvantage. Yes, um, but the disproportionate representation of Muslims in poor socio-economic areas is also a result of structural racism. I mean, why yes. is it that Muslim communities are overrepresented in poor areas? That in itself is part of the problem. As we know, it feeds into yes. the criminal justice system. We were, to, we were, to, we were yeah. told to live in these places. Is Absolutely. That what you're well. You, <laughs> Well, I mean, there are very clear dispersions. I mean, I, can, I disagree with a lot of what you said, but I don't, I, it would be too it would be too long to come back on that. But I, can, but, I disagree with a lot yeah. of what you said. I'll be honest with you. I mean, when you've said about smoking weed on the streets, we know that stop oh, yes. and search oh, yes. young black men are oh, yes. fourteen times more for likely, sure. yeah. and Asian uh, men oh, are sure. 11, 12 times more likely to be stopped. When you've got problems in schools, in middle class private schools, it gets glossed over. Um, when you're a person of colour, you're more likely to be arrested. And once you get within the CJS, then you will be more unfairly treated. People of colour tend to go to the Crown Court more, they will elect Crown Court trial. Because they don't trust the... Because they don't trust the magistrates or the district judges. It's a much, much higher conviction rate conviction. in the magistrates' court. Um, and then when you get into the Crown Court, people of colour are far more likely to be sentenced to immediate custody and to be given longer sentences than people than, than their white counterparts. Uh, and that's a fact. And interestingly, the Lamy Review shows that women of colour fare even worse than BAME men. Yes. Yeah, they fare even worse. Muslim hands, um, if you go on their website, they've done an excellent report that's been la launched, which I commend to you. Um, and there's also um, a very, very... Um, interesting report, we don't have time to go into it, but the Social Mobility Commission issued a report 7th of September, um, young Muslims in the UK face enormous social mobility barriers and that comes down to the repeated discrimination of like the situation you're born into, at schools article. and so on. Mm -hmm. And I of course commend Hashi's article, well you'll have to give us the links. It's on the Guardian, sorry. Oh right, the Guardian. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I explain exactly the issues that, that why people are becoming more socially mobile for, for some of the reasons. Yeah, yeah, so uh, you know we're all going to have differing views and I apologise if it seemed that we were perhaps laying the blame. I don't think anybody said people shouldn't get divorced. I think sometimes it's the best thing for people to do. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but I'm also a family practitioner as well as a criminal practitioner, that's why I say that. Um, sorry. Yeah, actually, I was just going to, I'll come back to it, but in terms of, just, just on the point that you said about France, it's funny because I had a figure 
Uh, 70% of the prison population in France uh, is Muslim, but yet they only make up 8%, that's about 60, 67,500 approximately prisoner, prison, prisoners. Um, in, in French prisons are Muslim, 70%, just, just on that. In terms of what you said, I mean, I take, I take on board of what you said. For me, I mean, I, I work within the criminal justice. Not, I, I'm not employed by a civil servant, but as a civil servant, but what I do is monitor or mentoring. So I, I'm in the system, but on the outside, so to, to hopefully make some difference. What we could do is, so prison systems don't rehabilitate. They don't. No. Just not for Muslims, it's not for the area. They don't, they don't. The lack of funding now, the prison, I can go onto a wing instead of having four or five prison staff, there'll just be one or two. They're locked up behind their rooms. I mean, I can sit here all day and tell you horror stories, so, but we're not going to go into that. But in terms of what we can do to make a difference is we need to have more representation in every society, in every public life, everything that we do, we need to be more representative. How can we change things like the Lamy Report? It's be, become more productive. So if we speak to our children and my forefathers and my grandfather, say, oh, I want our children to be a doctor or a dentist, they want an engineer. They didn't want them to be police officers, prison officers. They didn't want them to be civil servants. Unless you, unless we integrate and we're actually doing those roles, then we can make a difference. So, for example, if we're not monitoring the prisons, we're not monitoring the courts, we're not monitoring the custody suites, we're not in Parliament, we're not, we're not on the health boards. We can't make a change. They can't understand some of the cultural and religious issues that happen within those cultures unless we're there. So, we so it's about us challenging the racist institutions mm -hmm. and I think um, the situation in France, I, mm -hmm. I, I think one of the very simple uh, prima facie issues there is that the French are a lot more racist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Full stop. Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah, disproportionate yeah. impact on the Algerians, you know, we, we know about that. So I'm sorry we've taken a little while yeah, to get yeah, to yeah. you and then we'll come to you and then yourself. So one, two, three. Um, I don't want to give too much background because I know that we're running out of time, but um, some of the uh, topics that we discussed in my mind have led to my interest in extremist Islamic ideologies developing within prison systems in Britain particularly and how they are encouraged throughout the criminal justice system. I just wondered if there was any comments you'd like to make on how these ideologies are developed within prisons, if this is a any structural um, reasoning for that? Do you have any views? I, I, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take a couple more. I think that has been exaggerated um, mm -hmm. considerably. Uh, but do you, does anybody have a very, very, very quick... In terms of, you know, if, this, if you talk about sermons or any literature within the prison system, there's no sermons that, are, that everything is monitored within the prison system. So the, um, from the chaplaincy teams down to the individuals, down to the people, you can't sit around and talk within a prison system. There's no, there's no literature there, there's no, there is mobile phones, but there's no information there for people to be able to radicalise. Now, the, the way they used to, and is, is prisons are caught on is where they lumber people with extremist views all in the same prison, all in the same, so, so and they work, but what they've done is they've sort of spread them out, so that hasn't sort of affected a lot of the other prisoners, but the, the, te the extremism challenge, extremism prevent, all of that makes a small pop, yeah. pop, small or small percent, we're talking one or two percent out of the 98 percent or the 100 percent. Uh, of the prison uh, Muslim population. So it makes a small minute, and we, we need to be worried about in terms of more rehabilitation, housing, jobs, all of these other factors, mm -hmm. then, then the extremists, that's really down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. But that gets brought up in the news more than the other stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Um, you were talking about um, the offending rates being very high. Um, if someone came to you and said, um, I can donate you know, as much as you need, or I want to spend a blank check, basically, on bringing down the reoffending rates from the Muslim population, um, whether that's through a charitable initiative or a commercial initiative, whatever. What are the key things that you would say need to be tackled, or the objectives of that mission should be? So I think you touched on one already: is that actually when people leave prison, they want somewhere warm to go at night, and therefore they will commit you know some something to be able to then get back into us and i've heard that several times before so i think you know one of those things i think is to give them a roof over their head but could you perhaps suggest a few more um, things that you think need to be tackled to then bring that reoffending rate down considerably i think it's my you yeah. gave a brief list I, according to my experience i believe 
we need um, businesses to provide. Um, the government has an initiative, is if they take on an ex-offender, they get a certain grant from the government. Um, so if you said you had a blank check, I would just say, why don't you pay certain Muslim businesses um, to take on ex-offenders for work? I think that would help to reduce um, ex-offenders. And then also we need people from the Muslim community, um, whether they're professionals or lay people, to be mentors where they can meet up with an ex-offender twice a month. Where they can just go out for a coffee, Costa Coffee, go to Starbucks, or go to the local cafe twice a month, how you doing, how you keeping. And um, just to be there for the person, to signpost the person. And then I put, um, so at the moment now, two, um, sorry, National Zakat Foundation does a lot whereby also <coughs> what they do is they do a hardship grant. Now, I'm going to keep it straight with you. I don't know if anyone here is from the National Zakat Foundation. I'll just give you an example. I had an ex-offender. He came out of prison. And because he, when he went to prison, they ran up his um, rent arrears. So he had around, I think, £11,000 rent arrears. So he came to me with the bill. They, um, and he said, look, I've been, they're going to kick me out of my house. I've got nowhere to go. Da, 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 da. So I said, oh. I said, the only people I know if you go to the National Zakat Foundation. I'm going to, I'll be honest with you. Even though I said it, part of me was thinking, they're not going to pay the 11000 so I said, So I said, just go. He went there, I said, he said, it's not computer literate. I said, listen, just tell them you're not computer literate and that you need, you've got this picture, you're going to be made homeless. So we called them, they said, okay, went to the office, he showed them the bills, the National Zakat Foundation paid it off. So I believe if he, if he was made homeless, without a doubt, he would have went back inside. <coughs> And thankfully now he's outside, he's started up his own business, he's doing things. So we need more things like this, like hardship grants when people are going through rent arrears or different things in life. And, and the last thing I would say, like we have things like the Samaritans, like a helpline, because we underestimate things like counselling, like a helpline service where people could talk when they're going through hardships. Because um, as we know, when people go inside prisons, I don't know if... Um, and the, uh, we were doing a course and they were saying when people go into prisons they develop things like um, what's it called um, personality disorders and things like this mental health, mental health issues or counseling with issues so that would be mine mm. yeah. Yeah. it isn't just a prison part if we just look you know the, the issues around mental health two thirds of the prison population have a mental health issue eighty yeah. percent of them smoke um, so, so we're already two thirds um, have a reading in a literacy year of maths and an English level of an 11 year old, so that's six, year six. So we're working with difficult people. But you know, in terms of what you mentioned, housing, unless you've got a roof over your head, a job, benefits, all of these things aren't going to matter. So benefits can take a few weeks, by then you don't have, a, you don't have any money in your pocket, you can't get accommodation, what do you do? You get your grant, when you, everyone that leaves prison, they get a, a discharge grant around £48, £50. So that's not going to last you much in London uh, or, or in the metropolitan places. So accommodation is important, job. But the other, one of the things that we need to do, and I'll finish on this point, is that we as the Muslim community do need to be forgiving to, I, and I wouldn't call them ex-family service users. So you know, you, you don't, we, we keep looking at them because we, we look at them is it in disgust or in horror. So we need to change our own ethos. So when we look at people, we don't look at them with negative. Because if, I, I guarantee you most of the community will say, well, don't sit next to that person because he's been to prison, not knowing what the prison offence is, um, you know, if he's guilty or not guilty. But if we look down on people, how are we as Muslims meant to be better at helping those people? Yeah. Just a very brief, just on that very last point, my view in terms of this is beyond the Muslim community, we're just incapable as a society to give people second chances. And the reason why that's important is because, for me, if you're going to have less of a chance of re-offending, you need society to be able to look at you and say, yes, you've served your time, this is a new beginning for you. And I would go even one step further. If you have committed a crime for which you have received less than a year prison, or no custodial sentence, namely going to prison, once you've served your time, you shouldn't have to declare that on your forms when you, when you go to jobs. So you know how you have to say, have you had a previous conviction, whatever it is? I think we should have a way of giving people a genuine second chance. Because once they have to declare that, they don't want to fill out those forms. I'm not talking about the murderers 
the rapists, the people who have committed serious offences. If somebody's gone in for marijuana possession and they've served their community service, why should they have to declare that if they're genuinely trying to make a new start? That is all about the second chances that I mentioned earlier. I think we've got time for probably two more. So the young man there has been waiting and then yourself, sir. Um, may Allah, mashallah, may Allah bless all the speakers for the work they do. It's really Thank excellent. Uh, just a quick question for Hashid, brother Hashid. 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 Um, I grew up in the same area as you and I understand the sort of challenges that you face when growing up in the sort of, and I know about sort of the criminals and things that you take. I, you know, you're an excellent, much like you're an excellent, you're a great role model for us. You haven't met me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't let me see you. Yeah. How, how, did, how did you, how did you d d deal with and resist that challenge or deal with that challenge of, of, of resist? So, so that you wouldn't go along the criminal path or the wrong path. It, it's, it's a beyond today's uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. I will say two things. One, I will be here till nine, so let's talk later. Two, all my work is online. <laughs> I did a whole documentary. Yes. I did a whole documentary on the BBC <laughs> about my journey, and it's available on iPlayer. So I would, I would point you to that and all the articles that I've written. But it's a long story, and if I was to cut it to three words, luck, a grandmother who was incredible, and just seeing my older brothers make mistakes and realizing that I don't need to make the same mistakes or I don't need to do something that they did in order to realize the mistakes. So that's what I would say that is the short version. But definitely, you know, it was, it was a matter of luck in so many respects. Thank you. Uh, I want to compliment the four of you on your excellent presentation and on the excellent work you do. I am an Irish Republican and what I'm concerned about, there's two things I'm concerned about, is welfare and the other thing is the Prevention of Terrorism Act. The Prevention of Terrorism Act was originally used against the Irish. I was detained three times on the Prevention of Terrorism Act myself. In fact, I belong to the organization, which was the first uh, organization in this country for us to be detained. <coughs> Uh, now, it has been used to demonize the Muslim community now, and I am concerned that its use is going to result in a larger number of Muslim people being convicted, even on conspiracy, uh, when they're not even guilty at all, because the Birmingham 6 to Guildford, Ford and Choir 7 and on and on, the same thing is going to happen within the Muslim community. And I was recently here in Westminster Magistrates Court when Mohammed Rabani, uh, who is involved with Cage, is doing work, something like what I do myself and what you people are doing. Uh, he, he went to campaign for uh, some American that was tortured by American state terrorists. He went to the son's uh, wedding in, I think it was Qatar or Bahrain. And he came back uh, to Heathrow Airport and he was questioned under, 60, uh, under Article 67 <coughs> of the Prevention of Terrorism Act 2000. And the police, the examining officer, asked him at the airport, for the PIN number for his telephone and his uh, laptop. And he refused to give it, and he was convicted here recently at Westminster Magistrates Court. Uh, he got a suspended sentence virtually, and he was fined 660 pounds. So I believe that this is only the start of what's going to happen to the Muslim community when, they come back, when they're coming back from a pot. And uh, how can that be contracted? The second thing, uh, and I won't, I won't go on forever, is uh, welfare. Uh, I look after the welfare of IRA prisoners uh, and IRA prisoners' families in England, Scotland and Wales throughout the whole of the trouble. And we were able to pay, we were able to raise sufficient funds to pay the families uh, £10 a fortnight. Now, I got involved 50 years ago with ordinary prisoners and uh, mostly Irish prisoners. And the Irish prisoners met black prisoners and Muslim prisoners inside. And when I tried, when I came out to the community and went to the black people and the Muslim people and the Asian people and asked them to help the prisoners, they didn't want to know about it. And I, that, that was something that shocked me. But I think the thing is changing now. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that there should be some um, organization to provide welfare for the wives and the children of the prisoners because sometimes they are forgotten about the everyone concentrates on the prisoner and the wives and the children are having a terrible time 
you know, not being able to have maybe to have a meal at school and all sorts of things. So uh, I don't know what you, what can be done in order to uh, raise funds from the black community, or the Asian community, or the Irish community, whatever community you have to help prisoners. Thank you. Um, there's a lot written about um, the Muslim experience mirroring the Irish experience uh, and um, very similar tactics used and legislation used as well. Uh, and in terms of the welfare, there are um, a lot of Muslim charities. Uh, in, in the UK, the Muslim population um, is the biggest donator. Uh, uh, it gives the biggest amounts to charities. The Muslim, the Muslim community. Yeah, the Muslim community. Um, a lot of that, however, I think 90% of the charity giving that Muslims do goes abroad. And um, it is Muslim principle that charity begins at home. And that you should start the charity to those who are nearest to you. Whereas people tend to send to families or you know, other very deserving uh, uh, areas as well, Palestine, Syria, etc. However, I have seen in the last few years, I um, don't know if you've, you've seen this as well, you mentioned National Civil Art Foundation, Muslim Hands, uh, Penny Appeal. So a lot of the Muslim charities are beginning, have been actually for the last four or five years. Mm. They're doing a lot more work now <coughs> in uh, domestic violence, uh, with uh, ex offenders, service users, and so on. So I think we are yeah, finding that. Increase. that. Yeah. But certainly there's a lot more that could and, and should be done. Um, I think we're going to ramp up now, but I think um, just give, um, if the panellists wish to, if there's any last, very, very brief few words they want to say. Ismail, do you want to say anything? Um, you don't have to. Thank you, Felicity <laughs> Sokol, for inviting me and hope to network with everyone later. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Just, just, just one final thing to say that we need to have more integration and if you want to get involved, you want to be, and you don't know, come and see me, I'll, I'll take your information and I'll make sure you get in touch and be productive. And where we, instead of sitting back saying, well, they're doing this wrong, you're the one who could be pointing that finger saying we need to do it better. So, so um, please see me after and I'll provide that information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ashley? Thank you very much. Very it's much. all online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you to Dania as well. Yeah. For my part, um, thank you, Dania, Samira, Ben, thank you so much, as always. I got your name right, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> you just looked at me and I was like, oh my god, it's one of those really difficult <laughs> like, names. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, you pronounced it right. Yeah. I pronounced it right as well. Um, my parting words would be this in life, prevention is always better than cure. So we really need to start working with our young people before they get into contact with the criminal justice system. And I think uh, there's a lot to be done. Ismail and I have spoken over the years about setting up a Big Brother scheme whereby uh, professionals are, met, are, are coupled with young people in deprived areas, in schools where they may be struggling and that's where it really starts, at school, getting them on the right path and yes. so on. And so they can all be young hashies, yes. inshallah. <laughs> we share anyone. Mm. Uh, but thank you so much um, to my fellow panellists, to City Circle, and uh, thank you most importantly to all of you for coming to this evening. Thank you. Thank you.